intergenerational equity, subject close to my heart. Um, oh, this is a quality always a quality, no matter who gets it. And then I'm going to talk about the fair innings argument in principle and in practice uh, by social class, and then other possible uh, fair innings notions, and then the question of procedural justice versus uh, consequentialist approach, which is what I adopt most of the time. Right. That's the business for this morning, or well, the first half. Now, I had an opportunity, thanks to Robert, to uh, reiterate the point that the stuff that we've been doing in, uh, in this business up until now has been based on the assumption that being healthy is the same for everybody and being dead is the same for everybody. Okay, and you can, you can make a very strong ethical argument in favour of that because it says, I mean, who are we to make judgments about people's uh, uh, the desirability or undesirability of death or being healthy for different people? So it's very egalitarian, it treats everybody the same, it makes no distinctions, whatever according to uh, race, religion, age, sex, nothing, okay? Just the same for everybody. And the question is, so, and if that's, if that's acceptable, we need do no more. And the question is, is it acceptable? Is it, or is it not, acceptable? Uh, well, now, let me try something out on you. Suppose I were to, suppose we were chatting away here and I say to you, a colleague of mine was killed in a road accident last week. He was 75. Okay. Think of what, what commiserating remark you would make. Now I say to you, say, a different conversation. A colleague of mine was killed in a road accident last week. He was 25. Are you thinking anything different from what you were thinking before? I'm sure you are. Everybody does. You think differently about deaths of people aged 25 from deaths of people aged 75, don't you? And. I wonder, keep on thinking, keep on thinking about what you are thinking and why you are thinking it. Could it be that this is what you are thinking? Because that is the essence of the fair, that is the essence of the fair innings argument, that, that uh, it's not, it's always a misfortune to die if you want to go on living. But from, a, from a, a more general point of view, it's not a great tragedy if you've had a good life. You've, uh, you know, you've, you've, had your, you've had your fair innings, as they say, fair innings. Now, I think it's very interesting to think about, well, how do we, how do we think about this fair innings? I mean, what, if we pursue that line, what kind of numbers do we think? I mean, when, when have people had a fair innings? <clears throat> and I think there's a tendency for people to think in terms of uh, the fair innings argument that maybe Around 70 is a fair innings. There's a biblical quotation. Well, I'm getting things a bit out of order from where they are on your things, but don't take a notice of this. Um, <clears throat> Psalm 90, verse 10, says that. And I think that's had a very powerful influence in, in many countries, the notion that three score years and 10 is your, rat, is your 
that's your allocation. And if you've gone on beyond that, well, you've nothing to complain about, really. And when people talk about premature mortality, they often pitch it at around the age of 65 or 70. And say deaths before that age are premature, inverted commas, premature. So I think this is a very powerful uh, a bit of the folklore, and that's what it is, folklore, really. And it's very widely, very widely held. Now, I, I, I want to take that bit of folklore and turn it into a, 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 a quite powerful technical argument. So that's what I'm now going to do. So I'm leaving the folklore behind, and I'm going to plunge into the only really bit of technical economics that I need. So for those of you who are not really very happy about technical economics, you're going to be a bit unhappy about what's going to happen in the next five minutes. But I'll do my best with it. And don't let, don't let anything pass that you're, you're unhappy about. I'm going to take the widely used data in the UK on inequalities in health, which concentrate on the differences in life expectancy within males by social class. Okay? And the social class is the same as the ones I showed you before. The social classes four and five are unskilled manual workers. The social classes one and two are the professional and managerial classes. I'm forgetting the middle group. I'm just taking the two extreme groups and contrasting their life expectancy at birth. And what I have here is here's the life expectancy at birth of social classes four and five, and here's the, social, here's the same data for social classes one and two. And the current situation in the UK is there, which is where the professional managerial classes have a life expectancy at birth of 72 years and the ma unskilled manual of 67. That means children born into these families, children born into these families have that life expectancy at birth. Okay? According to which class you are born into, there's a five-year difference in your life expectancy. And that's the starting point for a discussion which rages all over the shop in Britain about inequalities in health by social class and how, how terrible they are. Okay, and how it's all wrong. Okay, how these poor innocent babies happen to be born in this family or that family have quite different life prospects. It's all wrong. Okay. Now, so, so now what I want to do is conduct a kind of thought experiment. I say, okay, so we think this is wrong. Now, why don't we put it right? And one of the reasons maybe why we don't put it right is that you can't put these things right without there being some cost uh, to doing so. And maybe the cost is a cost in terms of general population health, that it means shifting resources out of very cost-effective things for one group of people uh, who are already doing fine, like me, and putting the resources into something which is actually less cost-effective but helps more deserving people. So we have a trade-off. I mean, are we willing, how much of overall population health would we be willing to sacrifice in order to improve the distribution of health within the community? Classic economist toy, the equity efficiency trade-off. Okay. Now suppose I was able to think up some very clever survey method or interview method by which I could elicit how big a sacrifice in the health of the population at large you, each of you, would be willing to accept as a, a, a reasonable price to pay for eliminating this inequality. And that's what I have to, that tells me something about your personal degree of aversion to inequality in health. And if you say you'd be willing to sacrifice a hell of a lot, then you're very averse to inequality. And if you say to me, oh, I'm not going to sacrifice anything, well, then you're not really averse to inequality at all. So this number that I would try and elicit from you is, would be telling me whether you are uh, averse to inequality or not. Now, suppose I did that 
and I discovered that halfway between these two, the number is 69.5. Uh, but I'm saying, well, we can't actually do that. We've got to make some sacrifice. And suppose what I discovered, that the uh, group norm was that you'd be willing to sacrifice six months, but not more, of the life expectancy at birth for the whole population. So you would be, you would find that if we could make everybody equal at 69, you would regard that as being perfectly acceptable from a policy viewpoint. Okay, now let me just pause there and make sure everybody's with me, what I'm doing. I'm asking, I'm doing a, a social inquiry into the, uh, the degree of aversion to inequality by asking people how much of a fall in the life expectancy of birth of the whole population they would accept in order to eliminate inequalities. Okay. It's a classic trade-off issue, you know, which economists love, love these trade-off things. So I'll come up with the, the, the number I've got here is purely hypothetical. I have no idea what this number would be. Okay, so this is purely hypothetical. And I'm working on a project at the moment to find out what this number actually is, but it'll take a little while. Um, now, what, the, what we have then said is that that point and that point now are on the same social welfare contour. That is to say, from our point of view, these are equally good points from society's point of view. That's what my data told me. They are equally good. And we could say that, well, it's not that we have anything in particular against the one social class or the other. It would be just the same if the position had been reversed. Okay? So we also know that this reverse position would also be on the same social welfare contour. So I have three points now on this social welfare contour. And I could do more. I could also ask people what it would be worth sacrificing to reduce this inequality by half or by a quarter instead of totally eliminating it. So I could, I could get data all along here, but I can't be bothered with that at the moment. So what I've done is I've simply assumed that there is a curve that uh, goes through these th three points. Uh, for those of you who are interested, the one I've taken is a constant elasticity of substitution curve. Uh, through these three points because it has lovely mathematical properties which I can manipulate. And so there we are, there we go. So there's so that purple thing is my is my social welfare contour going through the current situation. Right. Still is it still okay? Every point on the red curve is equally acceptable from a social point of view. Now, if we could move in this direction by a small amount, it would be of equal value to us if the social classes 1 and 2 gave up 1 and the others got 2. That is to say, the policy trade-off is that an increase in life expectancy for social classes 4 and 5 is worth twice as much as any decrease for social classes one and two. It tells you the rate at which you should be prepared to exchange the life expectancy of one group for the life expectancy of the other group. And what you would notice is that if we did that and it worked, and slowly the current situation moved down here, that slope gets less and less okay, as we move along the curve. So this weight gets less and less. So instead of being 2 to 1, it becomes 1.8 to 1, then it becomes 1.6 to 1, then it becomes 1.5 to 1, and so on. And then when we get down here, it's 1 to 1. Okay, when we reach equality, it's 1 to 1. So <coughs> what that curve generates is a set of uh, weights on health benefits for the two groups, which gives greater weight to the worst off group, systematically greater weights. 
And so it could be used to calculate numerical weights, like the ones I just gave. If we were here, the equity weight would be 2 for, a, for a, a member of social classes 4 and 5 compared with social classes 1 and 2. So it generates an actual set of weights. Okay. Now that's the bit of technical trickery, and if you can accept that, if you accept that, you are now lost because I'm going to make it really work hard. <laughs> I think intuitively it's, uh, it's, it's not difficult to comprehend what's going on, but the, the numbers are a bit tricky and there are, there, are, uh, other, there are other ways of forming this curve which are really quite, imp could, be, it could be quite sensitive to the way the curve is actually created. The assumption, uh, there is an assumption Drill that um, there has to be a trade-off. Yeah, that's right. Um, yeah, it is possible that there is no need for a trade-off. I mean, totally yeah, it is possible. Yeah, it is. What I don't have. Yeah. 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 Uh, because I want to. T I want to put people in a position of thinking that there's a trade-off, even though there may not be in some circumstances, because I want to find out how strong is their aversion to inequality. And I can't find it out if I say, well, it's, it's okay, we can help the poor, and actually everybody's health will get better, because in fact what we're doing, we're putting a lot of resources into, into non-cost-effective things for the, for the rich, and we're neglecting cost-effective things for the poor. So the actual situation is exactly the reverse of the one that I'm asking you to think about. But that's about what the possibilities are from here, because if that is a situation, we don't have to move down here at all. We can move out into this space, okay? Now, if we move out into this space, however, we move on to higher contours, but we still have contours, okay? So the speed at which we move towards the equal position will be determined still by the shape of these contours. and. The degree of curvature of these contours is about how, on a, how at how it is to inequality. And in the one piece that I, the mimeograph paper which I circulated, goes through the reasons why this, these contours may take quite different shapes. Some of them may take quite odd shapes. I mean, in a Rawlsian model, it, it, they're L-shaped. They're not curved at all. They're like they're like L's, and that is to say only positions of complete equality are acceptable. You, you have no time for any others, yeah? Uh, Damien, uh, you did uh, uh, when studies uh, life at a different uh, of life in the expectancy between black and white. Yeah. And the, li the white life expectancy is uh, like six years higher than the six black. Six years. Six, six years yeah. higher than the black. And based on this indifference curve, can we suggest that the best approach to eliminate re this racial gap is reduce the life expectancy of white. One. And you, because yeah. it's a trade-off. Yeah. Based on that, it's a trade-off. If okay. you want to reduce the gap, yeah. then you have to sac sacrifice white life expectancy in order to gain okay. black okay. life expectancy. Okay. Is the unmean choice? Um, okay. Well, that's, yeah. The, Okay, now, but, yeah, now, but, and you're talking about what you would actually have to do, not what would be desirable to do. Okay, so it's quite interesting. No, but it's important, you see, because we actually have to have both these things in play. I here have only what it would be desirable to do, and you're talking about what you would actually have to do. And what you're saying is that if you want to reduce inequalities between blacks and whites, that there is actually, there is actually going to be a trade-off. There is actually going to be a trade-off. So that puts me back in the situation that I was in when I was playing this thought experiment with you. There really is. So you really have to decide whether you would accept it or not. Okay, so anything else on this before I move on? Because what I want to do now is to go on and apply this to this intergenerational equity business. Okay, but this is the, this is the bit of uh, technical economics that lies behind what I'm talking about, and it's all spelled out. It's all spelled out in the in the one of the papers you got there. 
Okay. Well, as I've already said, the, the popular folklore about equity and the data that I just used is, uh, is based on some notion of the fair innings argument in terms, in terms of life expectancy. Okay, it was all in terms of life expectancy. But I actually don't want it to be in terms of life expectancy. I think that suggests that mortality is the only critical issue. But uh, maybe that poor people not only don't live as long, but while they're alive, they lead much more miserable lives from a health point of view. They have more pain, they have more mobility, more mobility problems. So there's more to these inequalities in health than would be picked up simply by the life expectancy data. So I want to go on and use quality adjusted life expectancy instead of simply life expectancy. So that's what I want to talk about next. Here's my, here's my data set again, hard at work. Um, again, we, these are the Euroqual valuations. Uh, this is by age. These are males by social class, where the upper one is the social classes one and two, and the lower one is social classes four and five. This is a bit like that education chart I showed you a little while back. And I've now turned it back into social class, and it's males only. And uh, I've smoothed the data. The data isn't really, doesn't look as lovely as this, actually. But, uh, but it is based way back. There's some real data behind all this. Uh, <coughs> and what you observe here is that from the very beginning, the, the manual workers, the male manual workers, have poorer health than the professional managerial group. But there's not much in it until you get to about age 40. But after about age 40, things begin to diverge madly. And I think what's happening here is that the human body has a fair amount of reserve capacity. Uh, and this, it can take a lot of stress for a while. But by the time you get to 40, uh, it's used up this capacity. So the manual, uh, the manual workers who, who are subject to a lot of stress, physical and, and otherwise, um, they begin to go downhill rather rapidly. Uh, but the professional managerial groups who are also suffering from aging, they only go downhill very slowly. Okay, so these are the differences in health-related quality of life for males by social class in the UK according to our, our data, which is, as I said, 3,000 representative sample of the adult population of the UK, like England, Wales and Scotland. Okay, so I think that's a fairly straightforward bit of data, which nobody else but us has. Um, now, let's come back to these inequalities within the UK males by social class. Now, when we worked only on life expectancy, there was, this is a slightly different data set from the one years before, but these figures, instead of being 72 and 67, it's become 73 and 68. <coughs> this is a data set from about 10 years later. Um, so the difference is still five years. But if you put the quality adjustment in and you measure the thing at birth, the, the quality adjusted life expectancy at birth, using those quality adjusters that I, that I just showed you, um, and measuring the whole thing in qualities, it's a difference between 66 and 57. The difference has jumped up to nine qualities. Okay, so if you look at the difference in health-related quality of life, uh, health-related quality of life, quality-adjusted life expectancy, the differences are much larger than in life expectancy itself. Okay, because we've got on top of the differences in life expectancy, we've got the differences in health-related quality of life. Now. This is a very interesting statistic, which isn't normally calculated. Suppose we took the mean of those two and said, well, the fair innings consists of 61 and a half qualis, okay, which is half, simply taking the, the, the average number of the two social classes. It turns out that social class, a member of social class four and five would have to live to be 71 before they could get up to that score. They'd have to live to be 71. 
and less than half of them do so. Yeah. My lot, professional managerial classes, oh, actually I was born into that group, but never mind. Uh, social classes one and two would have to reach only 65 before they've accumulated 61 and a half qualis because they don't lose an awful lot along the way. And three quarters of them do so. So the difference is between males is that in one social class less than half will get to this number and the other one around about three quarters will get there. And that's the extent of these, the impact of these social inequalities upon the health prospects of males. It's really quite big. You know, it's, not trivial, it's not trivial differences. Now, I want to okay. I want to point out some. Well, is there any any observations about that? Is that okay? Yeah. It's probably only with U.S. data, and is, uh, if we look at um, white versus African American, yeah, the most reference for useful uh, statistics such as mortality, if you get age adjusted mortality in age group. Yeah. There's huge differences from day zero conception onward that completely disappear at yeah. age 60, 65, 70. So if, if that was a pro if your proxy of a social class and our proxy of a racial category had anything to do with each other, we've got wildly divergent um, conclusions. Yeah, well, uh, I'll come back to that issue in a little while because it's quite important, and that is if you look at the data, not life expectancy at birth, but year by year, you, the, the different, other differences begin to emerge. But the question is really from an, a social equity point of view, which is the most important thing? What are the prospects of a, a child born in the, the different groups? Is that an important equity issue in its own right? You see, at what point do you want to focus on a notion of social justice, as it were, because that's what lies behind all this. And I think social justice is very, very powerful to say at the at point of birth, really, because you can't then say, well, it's because they've been smoking or drinking or, or whatever, because they haven't at that point been doing anything. Um, it's true. It's you know, so I think from a moral point of view, there's tremendous strength attached to a tremendous moral weight associated with life expectancy at birth. Now, afterwards, it begins to get moderated by other things because you begin to say, well, it's partly their own responsibility or something, but you can't say that at the beginning. But it's a, bring this point up again a bit later on, will you? Because I'm going, to, I'm going to present some data a bit later about the impact of what happens over as people's lives progress. Okay? But I think, I, I, I think what you say, however true it is, doesn't diminish the weight to be attached to life expectancy at birth. Okay? I think it's really quite important, yeah? I'd like to pick up on that. I think that's a really useful point. Maybe it gets back two things to what you were saying before. What you do about it versus the idealized situation. Yeah. It's related to where the differences start to happen. But the second point, maybe take issue with the notion that we all start with a clean slate. Yeah. The probability of a live birth to a black mother and to a white mother might be quite different. Yeah. And hence, it goes back a generation. Yes. I mean, so it isn't that you start with a clean slate, per se. Yeah, the except... Generations are tied. My, yeah. my, my point really was just that by age 65, our effects have completely disappeared, at least in yeah. the age adjusted mortality rates, and your effects have... Completely yeah, but well, it's a point I'll come back to in a little while. A bit later. I don't want to disclose my hand just at the moment, but I have, a, <laughs> I have some other interesting points to make on that subject. Oh. Okay, anything else? I'm, I'm, I'll put that on hold, but do come back to us. Anything else at the moment? All right. Um, where am I? Here I am. Um, I've always been interested in bridging the great chasm that seems to exist between 
the way philosophers think and talk and the way economists think and talk when both purport to be interested in matters of equity in health and whatnot. So one of the, the things where my eyes lit up when I suddenly saw what you could do with this fair innings argument, which is a philosopher's argument, and the quotation I gave you at the beginning about fair innings it was actually drawn from the writings of a philosopher with whom I spend a lot of time disagreeing uh, rampantly, and uh, it continues. Um, uh, John Harris and I hardly ever see eye to eye on anything, uh, and I've teased him enormously for the fact that the fair innings argument, which he expanded, is a godsend to me as a way of, of pursuing this notion of equity rights, which he hates. Uh, but um, the great advantage of it, which I think is, is rare, is first of all, well, it's, it comes from folklore, but it's outcome-based. It's not process-based. It's not about equalizing resources between people or equalizing access. Or e it's about equalizing outcomes. Okay? It's, it's rare, very rare, to have a notion that's about equal, equalizing outcomes rather than anything else. It's about a person's whole lifetime experience. A lot of the data that's collected in the policy discussion is about inequalities of health at a point in time, not about a person's whole lifetime experience. And it seems to me the natural unit to use if you want to talk about distributive justice is a person's whole lifetime experience. So, and it works with a, a person's whole lifetime experience. It, reflects an aversion to inequality, although that's not usually made quite as precise as I'm busy trying to make it, but it, it, it wouldn't make sense unless you had uh, a notion of aversion to inequality. So it, that's, deep, that's deeply embedded in it. And the other thing, it is quantifiable. It is often expressed in numerical terms, even in a normal argument. You know, I started off by age 25, age 75. Well, we could play the game what about 55, 65, where, where exactly you're going to pitch it? You could actually have a discussion with somebody about a numerical value that uh, is the sort of fulcrum of this, uh, this balancing game. So those properties are there in the notion, even in the folklore. And those are all very important properties from uh, the point of view of somebody like me interested in, in quantifying ethical notions, which is what I, I keep on trying to do, quantifying ethical notions. And I think those are very important properties in the fair innings argument. Right. Now then. Let me move on a bit and come to this issue about what happens over somebody's lifetime. I mean, this is coming back to your point, really. Here, here's part of my original data again. And, and here, are <clears throat> this is the expected qualities over somebody's lifetime. And you remember I said that for um, social classes four and five, at birth the expected qualities were about 57. And for the others it was 66. Okay, So the left hand point there is the data I've been using so far. And, and I've put in here 61 and a half the supposed fair innings, but I mean that's arbitrary. You could move that up or down where the fair innings argument comes, but that reflects the 61 and a half that I used before. Is there that dotted line there? Now, social classes one and two uh, as they uh, survive and keep on surviving, um, their expected lifetime qualities don't change very much for a long span because of very few, very few social class one and two people die uh, in early or middle age. Um, they keep going until they get to about here, 60, 65, 70. Then they begin dying. And then the survivors, this is how the survivors are making out. The survivors expected lifetime qualities begin to rise sharply 
um, I'm currently about here, okay, on that on that trajectory. Um, I notice in the obituary note, in the obituary pages of the newspapers, a lot of my contemporaries are, 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 are leaving me, okay, and it gets more and more all the time. Now, however, look at social classes four and five. They start off down here. And their prospects are rising gently all the time because they do die at, uh, in the uh, um, 20s, 30s, 40s. More of them die. So the survivors' prospects are getting better because it was the, the uh, poor mortality prospects of the others that was dra were dragging them down at the beginning. And there will even come a point where at the age of about 65 or so, even the manual workers will, can now expect to, to, to get a fair innings. The survivors, but only the survivors. Okay. So what we now have to say is, well, even the, for the survivors, there are people in social classes four and five who will get a fair innings, but we won't know who they are until they're quite late on in life. Now, it seems to me, this, is, this data, what you were telling me, as I understand it, is that if these were the whites and these were the blacks, these two actually intersect at some point. They may cross over. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Yeah, and that's perfectly compatible with these big differences at birth, that when you get late on, but the reason for that is that very few of the blacks have actually survived that long. So it is quite important where you pitch your fair innings argument, and that's why I pitch it at birth, because otherwise if you pitch it later on, you'll be led to say, well, there's no difference really, but there is. So where you pitch, where you, where you make your pitch on moral grounds, you know, is really quite important. Okay, now, how does this work with equity rates? Well, it works like this. Turn this over and imagine that this is an equity weight of one, okay? This is an equity weight of one. And this was the equity weight of two or whatever it was that the social classes four and five got at the beginning. But as they progress, the older members of the community, the, old, the older members of social class four and five are going to get lower weight because their prospects are quite good. And, by the, and the social class is four and five people over here getting a weight of one, and down here they're getting weights less than one. Okay? This lot are getting weights less than one all the time. Okay? So the weights are inversely proportional to your prospects your chances of getting a fair innings, okay. or rather to your quality adjusted life expectancy, which seems to me entirely reasonable at an intuitive level. That's what you do. You calculate somebody's quality adjusted life expectancy, you compare it with some norm, and then you set the weight on benefiting them accordingly. And that's what I want to do. That's what, that's what I want my equity weights to do in the interest of reducing inequalities in health. And that means, that does not mean that you say when people have reached a fair innings, they don't get anything else. That's the end of health care for them. I mean, I think uh, I've been talking, I was talking last week to Dan Callahan. I don't know if you know anything about his writings, a philosopher writing on the ethics of care for the elderly in the United States. And he, his, he is advocating that when people have had a fair innings at some point, 70 or 75 or something, um, you don't offer them life-extending life treatments anymore. You only offer them life-enhancing treatments because they've had a fair innings. I, I don't think that's a very sensible way of going on. I, wouldn't, I, wouldn't, I don't think the distinction I wouldn't draw a sharp distinction between life extension and 
life enhancements, you know, length versus quality of life, because I think it's all a great amalgam, and I don't want to separate the two out, which is why I go for qualities rather than the end. But I think what I think what the implication that comes out of my approach is to say it's worth spending more money to generate a quality for a less advantaged person than it is uh, on a an advantaged person. So all I would say is that the cost effectiveness criterion is much more strict for the old than it is for the disadvantaged people. So it's a matter of how much money. So the equity weight, if I say it's worth spending twice as much for this lot to get a quali as it is that lot, that's how it would show up. So there's still a trade-off issue. Nobody is ruled out, but uh, what you're willing to spend to generate a given improvement varies according to who it goes for. And that's a test of how much we care about inequalities in health. Okay? Right. Bad news for us old people, I'm afraid. Um, because it means that what this says is that on grounds of fairness, on grounds of fairness, we should, we should discriminate against the old, that it's the equitable thing to do, the equitable thing to do. It may also sometimes be the efficient thing to do, but that's, that's another issue. That is to say, because older people have poor recuperative powers, um, many uh, medical procedures that would be fairly safe for a young person would be very, very dangerous for an old person, particularly surgery different kinds of surgery, so uh, on, on efficiency grounds you might also discriminate against the old. But this is an argument based entirely on equity notions. And it generates, what I, it seems to me, in Britain anyway, an, an unacknowledged dilemma because if we really want to reduce inequalities in people's lifetime experience of health, we must discriminate against the old. Now, people go up in arms, get up in arms about discrimination against the old. They say it's not fair to discriminate against the old. And I'm saying, but it is fair to discriminate. It's, it would be unfair not to discriminate against the old if you, if you believe in the fair innings argument. And I think most people when you talk to them, especially old people, say they do believe in the fair innings argument. They do think that uh, the young should get priority over the old. Most old people think that, and they'll say that. Uh, and yet, we have this ageism business. Well, I think ageism is a bloody good idea. It has a very, very strong ethical justification. Okay? So we have to think hard. I mean, do we really want to reduce inequalities in health? In which case, we've got to get to be ageist and proud of it. Okay? So that's what I'm struggling with at the moment. And it's okay for me, because I'm old. So I, I, mean, I occupy the high moral ground. So it's, it's fine, you know? And, uh, okay. Any, anybody? I wish to dissent from this uncomfortable, very uncomfortable conclusion. I was just going back in the way that I can't formulate the question clearly about um, whether, how it all, at all this links to capacity to benefit. Um, yeah. As a, as a principle, um, yeah. let's think about something. Okay, it's still there. Question. It's still there. Hypothetically, an older person with enormous capacity to benefit? Um, it's still in there. I mean, the point is, remember, my equity rates, 2 or 0.5 or whatever, are applied to a quality gain. So if for an old person the quality gain is very high, all I'm doing is reducing it a bit, but it may still survive any reasonable cost effectiveness criterion. But it's got to be more beneficial to get through the net than it would have had to have been for a, a disadvantaged person. So 
So it doesn't stop us doing hip replacements and things like that, which are very beneficial for old people because the benefits are enormous and the costs are not that great. Um, um, so there are plenty of things you would still find it very, very beneficial to do for old people, but it creates severe doubt as to whether it's worthwhile having uh, turning um, intensive care units into terminal care for the old. I mean, that wouldn't survive. The other thing I struggle with in all of this, where through all your examples, you pull up, you put social class, the, the, the social class inequity is what yeah. sort of runs through here. I guess I had sort of moved in my mind to thinking if the if the quality adjusted life, either the present or the potential uh, quality adjusted life years of an individual or of a subpopulation were kind of either the baseline or the standard for improvement, then in a way, whether you're in uh, a social class or not, or old or young, kind of falls away because the measure itself sort of en encompasses that. Yeah. And I, I just find myself, I, I don't quite get it, but I kind of find a bit, I mean, are you, is it a double emphasis? Uh, when you're already using, I mean, if poor people have lower quality adjusted life years as individuals or as populations, then it's already there at the baseline, isn't it? Uh, yeah, but remember that um, the calculations we're talking about is distributing the benefits of health care from wherever the baseline happens to be. So what I was saying, what we're saying is that instead of saying, well, we can give this person an extra 10 years uh, healthy life expectancy. And I'm saying, well, we should be willing to spend a lot more money to give that to a poor black person than to a rich white person. Okay? As a matter of policy, we should do that. And so the low baseline of the poor black person uh, gets picked up in the equity weight. But is that okay? I mean, you, you should look at how you're worried about that. There are two separate questions here. You're grappling with what's cost effective and what makes sense. And as I understand it, this is independent of that. This is a pure value judgment. Do you, it goes back to specifying a value for how much aversion to yeah. inequality that you have. That's right. Which yeah. is completely independent of whether anything works or doesn't work. No, I wasn't, yeah, it's more confused than that. So. <laughs> I wasn't even going to the cost of this part yet. I was just thinking that, um, but let's hold this for the day. Uh, okay. Uh, All right. Uh, okay. Right. Um, anything else on that? Now, where are, we, where are we? We've got five minutes to go. All right. I'll start off and I'll start, I'll start a hair running, which I like doing. Um, I've concentrated on social class and I've concentrated on age uh, as uh, critical things, but when people talk about whether a quality is a quality is a quality, they talk about age, sex, marital status, whether people with or without children, whether people with children should be given more weight than people without children on ethical grounds, what occupation is in social class. Also whether or not people are cared for their own health. is the is the same fair innings appropriate for smokers or non-smokers? If you say smokers and non-smokers are all members of the same community, and so the same fair innings applies to all of them, that implies that smokers, uh, smokers have a right to, uh, to uh, be discriminated in favour of at the expense of non-smokers. Okay, if they're all members of the same community or the same family, or should we declare there's a different fair innings for smokers and for non-smokers? You know, for smokers, the fair innings is 60, and for uh, non-smokers, the fair innings is 65. Is that, is that what we should do? Whether or not people are cared for their own health? So if people have not cared for their own health, they've forfeited part of their entitlement, as it were, to a fair innings. And, I detect in the, in the literature and in the 
ordinary people's comments, quite strong feelings along those lines that uh, you, you, we, there are reasons to differentiate um, between people. But I want to, so there's a very interesting set of arguments about social ethics concerning who, who, are, who are members of the same community and who are different communities from the point of view of their moral, their moral claims. Okay? It's about their moral claims. And do you forfeit part of your moral claims if you behave in a way that the rest of the community thinks is irresponsible? Right, now then, moral claims. Um, this fair innings argument is um, males versus females. The data on differences in life expectancy between males and females in Britain is practically identical to that of different social classes within males. Okay. There are big differences in life expectancy. And the question is, are males and females members of the same community or are they two different communities? If they're members of the same community, then the males are getting a raw deal. Okay? Uh, uh, and it's not fair. It's not fair. Now, the feminist movement has been arguing for some time that we must treat males and females as members of the same community. They should have the same opportunities for education, jobs, etc., etc. Well, more important than education and jobs is health. Okay? Far more important, I would say. So, are we entitled? as members of the same community, to the same health. I'm not talking about health care, I'm talking about health. Health as measured in quality adjusted life expectancy. Now, if, why, why should we not be equally averse to inequalities between males and females as we are as between life expectancy at birth between blacks and whites or whatever? Yeah. How do you, uh respond to uh, someone who would suggest that the, uh, the males are experiencing less health, if you will, because of personal choices in terms of what they eat, what they drink, how they take care of themselves, whereas women might be more uh, inclined to take care of themselves. I would be very impressed with that if it weren't for the fact that more young women smoke than young men. So, I mean, it's if it were true. If it would, yeah, well, it's fairly recent, but I mean, I think it, 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 that puts the issue on another one. That's about the extent to which people are responsible for their own health. So you're saying that men are largely responsible for these differences, and if they behaved in a more responsible way, and uh, and so, but I would t I would occupy I would trade that across the whole community. So it would be. Um, if people smoke or don't smoke, that's taken out of the equation, okay? Now, if you take that out... A little more to my statement, because I yeah. probably... Yeah. It, it might be that society inflicts that on the males by society's expectations of males to act in certain ways in order to be men. Yeah. But it's a, it's a social thing that's inflicted on them, and then they in turn act out their, those roles and then experience the health. Okay, well then, they can't be held responsible for it. So it works the other way. You see, you've got to, if, if, if you take the view that people should be held responsible for adverse consequences of their health of things for which they are in part or wholly responsible, we take that out irrespective of males, females, social class or whatever. You just take that out. And then we're left with some residual differences. Now, where do we go from here? Now, people have also said, well, there's a residual, there's a difference between males and females which is genetic. Um, and that, uh, and there have been various estimates so that the genetic component between men and women is probably about two years. I don't quite know how people make that calculation, but uh, that's the thing that the World Health Organization came up with. They thought there was about a two year difference, which is ascribable to genetic factors. Um, so we take two, we'll take two years out and we'll take a bit more out, but 
you know, in some communities these differences are enormous. Seven years, eight years difference. Life expectancy at birth between, between male and female babies. Now, is it fair? That's the question I pose. Is it fair? For me? A quality difference. Uh, yeah, quality difference. Well, let me go back over. Uh, it's not so marked. The data I showed you earlier between the social classes in Britain, males, this is the comparable data for, for males and females. The, the heavy black line is the males and the fainter line is the females. Again, this is heavily manipulated data. It's very much smoothed over. But you can see that, in fact, there isn't much difference in the health-related quality of life of males and females until the later ages. And then it's quite marked. The women are systematically in poorer shape than the, than, than the, than the men are. I think it's largely due to uh, the crippling effects of arthritis, I think, is the, the big thing that, um, that sorts things out at this point. So these differences here. But of course, that could also be interpreted in a different way, that the numbers of women surviving to those ages is much greater than the number of men. So what's happened? The men have all been killed off in middle age, and the few surviving men are the real tough, tough people. And where most of the women survive into later age, but they're in a rather more decrepit sh shape. Okay. Well, like with the black curve, uh, is it okay? Yeah. So. The quality differences aren't much different from the life expectancy differences. The life expectancy differences remain more or less untouched by the quality adjusted, the quality differences between the two. Is that what you wanted to know? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Like you said, a genetic yeah. difference, an environmental difference, what kind of environment you were born with. And yeah. you have a female and male, probably biological difference. But at the same time, as you said, and their social role expectations, and then sometimes in female fields, um, they have to be patient about their pain so that they are not, they do not access to health care because then they feel that's their role. And on the other, other hand, male feel um, it, they can't say, um, they can't admit they have mm. some disease because, of, because they want to be a real man kind of things. Yeah. So including those social roles and biological roles and everything all together as a quality measure, we might meet some important information. Okay, well, if you want to unpick it and sort that out, by all means do, but you've got a, you've got a really big uh, discrepancy to explain away, okay? And if you can explain it away in some way or other that's ethically uh, relevant, fine. But I think this question isn't even being addressed at the moment. And I want to open it up. I mean, I know it's a Pandora's box, and I know it's not, I'm going to lose even more friends than I've lost already with this ageist argument. Um, and I get into sexist arguments as well and say sexism is a good thing and we should have more of it. I mean, like I said, with ageism. I mean, and I, I think it's true. I mean, I, I'm going to take a lot of convincing that this is not inequitable. I think it is inequitable. Well, let me throw back you into the group. Why, I mean, why has this inequity, Genetic, let's say genetically adju adjusted for genetics, <laughs> you know, uh, why has that not got the attention of social class or race or other kinds of, at least in the liberal community, I think, at least here, and I don't know about in Europe, you know, those kind of things are, you know, let's do about it, we kind of say, yeah, we ought to, you know, those gaps, the secretary has said the black and white health should become equal and all that, but we don't even, um, deal with this. Why is that? And what about other countries of the world? Then? I mean, it's also off the table. Yeah, it's off. I don't think it's on the table anywhere, as far as I can see. 
It should be on the table in Japan because Japan has the biggest differences of any country between the males and females. But I think the, the but uh, and it's funny in Japan because in Japan I think the females are an oppressed group, whereas I think in the in the United States and some in England the males are the oppressed group. So. <laughs> <laughs> to bring these issues out and say, why, you know, why is this off the table? But it's going to be a little tricky. <laughs> well, it's also one of several. I mean, it intersects with class and race. And, I mean, it, we don't sort of address these things. I mean, we can talk about them in isolation, but when you start looking at your information sources, they're, they're mixed together. And so you will see instances within um, race discussions of equality of health care of male versus female and that yeah, and with you know, and race right, and, and social yeah class, and yeah. so the dialogue will go but I think um, just the male female dimension is not really just that way. Yeah. well it's something that's been studied in, in human biology and physical anthropology which is my <coughs> my graduate work and so I'll, we always approach it in terms of biological differences yeah I, I mean we, we are aware of the social differences, but we feel that they're. I mean, mean, meaning that this is all genetic. No, it's not. Not no, 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 no. Nothing no, no. all no. genetic. You're not yeah. saying it's two out of seven. Well, it it's starts. Six it's, out of it's, seven or something it, like that. As far as I know, in, in all groups, um, for example, male fetuses are more fragile than female. Male infants are more fragile than female, mm -hmm. and it's across. As far as I know, it's across all yeah. groups. Is it across all species, Martha? Uh, I don't know. No. Yeah. That doesn't account for six, seven year differences. Well, well, she's saying it might. I mean, if it did, it makes it a lot easier. You know, if the total black white difference was sickle cell anemia, you know, straight genetics, you know, it, I mean, that's a different kind of an argument than if it's not, right? It varies tremendously by society. You can actually map out in India and China and places where there's selective neglect, where you'll get by age two or three, you'll get a major mortality difference because the women are dying because they're not getting fed. Um, and in the United States, it's not true. Everybody gets more or less compared to yeah. other societies. My, my problem with your argument is that one of accessibility, it seems to me that um, uh, health care is equally accessible to males and females. It's uh, disproportionately utilized by females who, um, but I doubt that that has much to do with capacity to benefit. No. I imagine no. that most of the differences um, in mortality are not from interventions that, that actually have demonstrable capacity to benefit, that they're, act, that they're more underlying social behavioral um, causes which we're not going to change with health care. No, I agree. I don't think it's necessarily a health care issue, but it's a health issue. See, that's why I want to make that the thing's a health issue. I have one big question for you. When, when you're doing external validity tests of the quality of the Uroqual measurement, um, was there a difference? You, you didn't show us any gender differences. My, my understanding or my prejudice is that there's a big major uh, life expectancy difference in males and females across the whole bound, but interpretation of health states um, may be different between males and females given uh, externally, you know, validating functional assessments. When you're when you're looking at people in equal health states or, or functional states by external clinical measures, um, were they reporting the same kind of college? I don't I don't regard clinical measures as validating. <laughs> Well, no, I mean, for the reason I mentioned earlier, because we know there's very poor correlation between the clinical measures and the impact on people's lives. So how could you do a measurement of impact on people's lives and then validate it 
by some useless clinical one measure. I mean, can walk, one person can walk a thousand feet, and one person can walk ten feet. There's yeah. a big difference. Or one person has yeah. his life expectancy yeah. of ten years, and one person has a yeah. One year. Well, the, those are those are hard, because the life expectancy doesn't come into the quality of life measure, except if people are very anxious about uh, impending mortality. But I mean, the, the mobility measures are highly correlated. There, that's the easy part. How about just overall male versus female in quality? We know there's a big mortality. I, I, told, I showed you just now. That's it. No, that's just quality. That's just quality. That's quality, quality only. That's quality only. There's practically no difference. Yeah, but that's self-reported. That's self-reported, and it doesn't deal with the issue as to whether women are more or less prone to report things than, than males are. I mean, that's rather more difficult to, to, to tease out, but I mean, we should tease it out. But I think we should... Just to say, the difference is in the life years, not in the... Yeah. Yeah. Except that they're out there in yeah. the I think we'd better pause for a coffee break, hadn't we? But I mean, there's no reason why you shouldn't keep on talking about this over coffee. And if you sort it out by the time we come back, let me know, would you? Okay.